what is going to make us grow the fastest? And all these ideas have a lot of merit, but what's the biggest ones? Let's see those to the finish line. Chad Peterman here, and you are listening to Can't Stop the Growth, a platform for leaders and teams to grow and thrive. We highlight the importance of personal development, pursuing greatness, and always chasing your potential. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Can't Stop the Growth. I'm your host, Chad Peterman, and today I have a good friend of mine. Uh, Most of you uh, listeners probably know him uh, or have heard him speak or been to one of his events uh, or just generally listen to a lot of his advice. I know I listen a lot and we trade ideas quite often, which is great and uh, really excited to have him on the podcast just to talk shop, really, uh, kind of what we do all the time, but uh, put it on a recording. So, Without any further ado, we'd like to welcome Tommy Mello to the podcast. What's up, Tommy? What's going on? Glad to be here, brother. Good to see you. Yeah, absolutely. For those of you listening, we're doing the uh, podcast roadshow uh, today. We're going to do uh, Tommy's podcast later this afternoon. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, if you listen to both of these, I'm sure it'll just be one string uh, uh, of conversation. So, Tommy, what uh, what's going on? What are you what are you working on? I know you're working on a lot, but what are you working on right now? There's a lot of things, man. Um, obviously, I got the Freedom Event coming up September 25th. That's going to be amazing. Got two houses heavy in construction, so that's been keeping me busy. And then, you know, I made a lot of investments, but A1 is, uh, A1's got an under two year track before we find a new sponsor. So getting ready for what that 12 month sprint's gonna look like. The decisions that I make today are gonna really affect what happens. And I'm planning on just having out my ducks in a row through March, and then I'll be on the clock. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you've been with Cortec, what, a year and a half, two years? About a year and a half, yep. We did the deal uh, December 2022. Yeah, so one of the things we're working on right now, and um, I talked with uh, Amy on your team a couple weeks ago, I can't remember now. Um, wh- I remember one of the things that you said when Cortec first came on was they kind of maybe not forced you, but made the uh, suggestion uh, around your call center. And I know that you have worked really hard. Obviously, Amy's a huge part of that. Tell us a little bit about how you kind of rebuilt that or kind of restructured it to be more efficient. I think that's one of the things, as I've talked to people, where people are missing is all they think about is marketing and they don't think about how the call center is a piece of that overall marketing. Yeah, I mean, the call center, I think, is the number one thing I talk about when I invest in a company. It's it's making sure. My mom used to answer the phones in 2010, 2011, 2012, and she was just so joyful on the phone and, and showed the right demeanor and the right attitude, the right empathy. And whenever I showed up to those jobs, I mean, I saw that the client was like open arms. Like, what? A, this is a great experience. And I don't think we fight enough. I don't think very many companies fight enough for the jobs. Uh, we say we got more leads, you know, and and you got to fight for everyone and you got to turn every one of those into a sold conversion and you, you got to get a good average ticket and you got to offer more and you got to treat every client the same. So I think the call center is the root of most problems with companies is just getting that booking rate and fighting for the client and really making sure your voice and even if you're acting, like just everyone has kind of a, an alter ego that they got to become when when booking a call and even sometimes with different people. I mean, all of us treat different people different. Like you treat your kids probably different than you treat your parents. I mean, different ages, but you know what I mean? Different relationships you treat. So you got to go into this acting mode of just like really, really, really make them feel good about the conversation and work on your tones. If you do that, you're going to win and you got to fight for every lead, man. Fight like it's your last one. And it's something we're working on. I mean, it's never where I want it to be. It's just, if we're not booking a phone call, I'm like, why? And we fight and we need to fight harder. Yeah. What, what the, from like a booking rate standpoint, what are you, what are you kind of shooting for? And just so people have kind of a, you know, peg. Yeah. We're booking around 87, 88% right now, right in that range. Uh, sometimes it goes above that, but, um, Personally, I think we could hit 93%. I mean, that's kind of my target is where I want to get. I want to fight harder. That's a lot of money when you're talking about as many calls as we're taking. That's a lot of opportunities. And 
the way I explain it to the call center reps is, uh, you know, someone's sitting at home waiting for a job, especially in, we're in a lot of markets. Someone's like, if you don't book that call, they're, they're staying at home. You know, and we, we do pay a threshold minimum if you, if you don't have jobs, which is very rare, but, do whatever we got to do to get out there, especially in slower markets. I understand. And then the dispatcher's job is to find out who we can move to tomorrow if it's not an emergency, if we overbook. But the CSR's only job is to book that freaking call. I mean, get that job booked. How do you how do you kind of one of the things we run into is, you know, especially in our business, when it gets hot, your your capacity gets limited by the number of technicians that you have. How do you kind of how do you monitor the relationship between the call center booking every single call and your capacity not being a hindrance to them being able to book. You know, if I can't book you for three days, well, then they may go somewhere else because they need the problem taken care of today. How do you how do you kind of manage that relationship between kind of the call center and then your dispatch team? So we've got this. We do we need to do do a really good job of this. I mean, we do a good job. But I want to do better. Is just saying, listen. We're going to move some things on the schedule. I'm going to get you figured out today, but I got to put you on for Thursday. You know, today's Monday, but I'm going to call you back and I'm going to move some stuff around. I just don't have the slot open, but I'm going to fight for you to make sure this gets handled. Now, dispatchers, that's their job. So on another note, capacity planning is the hardest thing in business. You got to have the call center, the dispatch, the technician work correctly. We've been really monitoring. Do you make it to your first job on time? Believe it or not, 78% of my technicians, we're tracking this now as of last week, are not to their first job right on time. It's not like they're two hours late, but they're not there to begin the window. The fir- Starting off the first call right dead on. If it's 8 a.m., you need to be there at 8. Your first call, you need to be on time. Yeah, it's the only time that we can really guarantee a customer that someone's going to be there because the rest is kind of, you know. You're taking it at uh, at a whim, just depending on how jobs go and and so on and so forth. Are you using any technology within? I know you are, but any technology within the call center that's you know helping out efficiency or booking or anything like that that you're excited about? Yeah, I mean we're we're building some stuff on top of Chirp. Uh, Chirp has done great because you can automate anything. So Schedule Engine has some cool stuff coming out uh, that's now under Service Titan. Uh, the, the service team is building a new VoIP software. That'll be the new call center pro. We're working heavy with them to get that out uh, and released into testing. But, you know, Chirp, if you don't book the phone call, you can send a follow-up campaign with some type of automation. Abandonment call, and, and this is the deal. Most companies aren't tracking abandonment call, like when they don't get to it. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy to me that companies still make so much money. And they don't track these simple little KPIs like, did you answer the phone on a Sunday? Did you answer the phone on a Tuesday night? Did you answer the phone on a holiday? And a lot of people don't. And I'm not too keen yet on AI when it comes to the call center. I don't think it's where I would want to book the call yet. So until I get comfortable with it, until I say, you know, and I'm 41. I mean, I'd say our average clientele is between 35 and 60. So... You know, if if I'm 41 and not super comfortable, I don't think a 55 year old is exactly excited about it. You know, we still like good customer service. For sure. Yeah, I can hear my dad saying right now, God, you know, you gotta be, you know, answering right for where are you from? What's going on? I can hear him now. <laughs> One thing I was gonna ask you about that we're fighting right now is trying to, when we look at all the calls that are coming in, the number of like, I don't know if they're robo calls or I know there's like tele telemarketers. Are you doing anything to like, I guess, like push those away so that your people aren't having to answer those calls? Our job, because we're doing, we're, we're, we're jumping way more into affiliate marketing. I mean, we just launched that this month. month. You got to get off the phone. Like, boom, click. Like, if it doesn't sound like a lead, either you turn it over to another department or click. Because when you're paying affiliates out on top of it, if the call lasts more than 60 seconds, some of them are 90 seconds, you're paying for it. Regardless if it's a lead or not, they'd rather structure it in like a minute, 30 seconds. So our job is just to get out the phones very, very quick. Okay. Just move them off the phones. What, tell me a little bit more about a, this affiliate marketing. What are you doing there? 
So there, there's this. If if you ever seen like, what's a good example? Bang the energy drink. How there's beautiful girls always drinking them all over social media. Those girls get paid. So there, there's three different buckets that you need to think about when it comes to affiliate marketing. Number one is there's all these different affiliate like monster networks. If you go to Affiliate Summit, you'll learn a lot more about it. But we're using Impact. And it'll, it'll be like thousands and thousands of people that know how to generate leads, not all specific to home service, obviously. So these people have ways, whether it's social media, whether they figured out a hack on, on banner ads, whatever it is, they know how to generate lots and lots of leads. Maybe they build their own websites. Um, and you got to monitor them very carefully because not all the leads are quality. But once you build the right affiliate network, it works well. And then the second group is like influencers on social media where they'll post for you. You give them a garage door. You might give them free deco hardware. You might pay them. It might be, for me, a landscape architect. It might be, it could be anything really. So that's the second bucket. The third bucket is your your clients and your employees. And all this stuff is trackable with attribution to make sure they get paid and to make sure they get paid in real time. And when it's done correctly, and I have not been too super far into this yet, but you know, from what I'm told, we should be able to double our amount of leads. Now, the quality probably won't be as high, but I'll still take double the leads because our guys are trained to to build trust and and turn those into something. So you know, right now we're a home service company. I'm trying to kind of equally go into home improvement, which is windows, bath refitter, garage doors fit into that category if it's replacement. Now, I've been always on the demand side of service. I mean, we're still 62% services of revenue. I want to shift more when you need to buy a really, really high end door where your company. We're not, that's not a us today. Uh, that's more. White glove, red carpet service. And when something goes wrong, you better be there the same day because these people have Lamborghinis to park there. (laughs) So on the, uh, we were talking a little bit about the affiliate and I think something that we've tried to build and again, not too far into it, but from like a referral, like to me, like your guys, like if it's pest control guys, if it's you know, landscapers, if it's, are you guys using anything in kind of the markets that you're in as far as like, like a B2B referral program that you're using? Yeah, this program would fit through this process, the one that we're building, but there's some other software too we're looking at, but it's between this and and what we're already doing. Obviously there's a lot of opportunity there, but it's got to be plug and play. It cannot be, the more automations you use, like with Chirp, I want to take it out of the technician's hands, whether we're getting paid an affiliate fee or they're getting paid an affiliate fee, the company I'm working with, the more automations you could do where it doesn't need to be a human being trained to turn over another type of lead. Because as you know, they, they can barely focus on what they, what they have to sell, trying to get them to do other stuff and pay, hand out flyers and bring stuff up. It's not easy. So building around that idea is, is difficult unless you're going to automate it. Like, for example, if I've asked a pest control company to give me those catchers on the corner of the garages, and we're just going to automatically, when, when the pictures are there within the forms of service tie, and it sends the customer a picture of those and says, we did this for you. We also work with this company. They do great. They do the owner's house. The reason he loves them is because he's got two dogs, and he'll show a picture of the dogs. And these guys do a fantastic job and they work with us and they'll come out and spray your whole house for 99 bucks. Their goal is to get them on perpetuity. Uh, and then they'll pay us. And then the same thing, where do, where do all the bugs get in? On the bottom of the garage door. So the bottom rubber. So they'll, they'll flag those. We'll go replace them. We'll pay them. Easier said than done. I mean, there's, there's, as you know, there's a million projects going on, a lot of fish to fry. Where's the biggest bang for your buck? And... These things have just progressively gone on. They're not where I need them to be. And it's so hard because I'm always pushing my team and nothing moves as quick as it used to. We're still doing great. I mean, revenue's through the roof, profits through the roof. It's like, what is going to make us grow the fastest? And all these ideas have a lot of merit, but what's the biggest ones? Let's see those to the finish line. 
Yeah, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And I think it goes to, you know, what a lot of people are thinking about right now, right? It's how do I <clears throat> how do I lessen my dependency on Google? How do I generate leads in other, you know, other ways that I don't have to depend on Google to keep my guys busy? It's tough right now. Google is just it's overpopulated. I mean, there's companies left and right that are coming up. A lot of them fail, though. We know that. You know, I was talking to Tom Howard and he's like, not a lot of companies are growing right now. Very few. I mean, in, in the scope of what service and service Titan's the best, the best under the service Titan hood. And so I don't know. It's definitely not like it was during COVID where phones were ringing off the hook. You couldn't get there. They'd still book harder to attract talent back then. But still, I mean, we're very happy at our growth rate. I'm just pulling out all the stops. I'm like. This thing needs to be, because my decisions, like I said earlier today, we're restructuring the org chart. We're doing a price increase this month. We, we've got so many things. We've, we've restructured the whole price book. We went from like 20,000 items to like 200. We're just simplifying everything, going back to the basics. Yeah, I think that's been the thing coming out of COVID is it's, like you said, during COVID, you didn't have to pay attention to the basics because leads were just flying in. And so now it's how do we get back down to it, um, kind of rebuild kind of the, you know, the fundamentals of how we do things um, and then and then move forward. So one of the things that I've struggled with as we've gotten bigger is just, you know, communicating out to the team. As you get more people, they get further and further away from you, it seems. And you can't be and, you know. You can't talk to everybody and different stuff like that. How do you, with, you know, always getting bigger, always expanding, how do you work to, from your seat, obviously there's a bunch of things from a cultural perspective that, you know, you have in place and, and things are moving. How, how do you as the leader continue to kind of coach and motivate and, you know, kind of be that pillar of your culture at A1? Uh, well, it's a great question and it's, it's hard for, you know, what I used to do, then I'll kind of go into, like, I used to have this board where I could have the cell phones of every single employee and I get notifications on birthdays and stuff. And it just became really, um, the software was like 10 steps and it became too time consuming. So I'm getting a new executive assistant on top of the one I have. She's going to be more of a chief of staff. So we're building this new software. We're calling it right now, CEO cockpit. It's going to be internal for, for a while. And, it's going to have all the birthdays, the anniversary days, but it's also going to feed into Power BI. It'll tell me best days, worst days, really key outliers, the best performing markets. With the installers in Orlando set a record, it'll say those things as snippets. And so my plan is to send 20 to 30 messages a day. It could be a handwritten letter because I got an ability to do that through the software. Could be a video, could be a quick message, could be a just a text could be a voice memo, uh, could be an email. But the plan is to use all these different spots and eventually social media and just just send 25 out a day. It won't take long because my EA will set it all up. So say these are the 25 people. Five of these people seem like they're just down and out, have not been performing to their norm, 20 of them. I got three birthdays, six anniversaries, and 11 people you need to recognize. And, that, and then I'm going to be able to form groups in there. And... You know, that's the plan is just my my involvement needs to be 10x what it has been. And I couldn't do it just by making phone calls and digging for information all day. I just want it there on one user interface. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's too, you know, trying to, I always say culture is a is a verb. Uh, it's not just the fancy break room and the, you know, the ping pong table. It's, you know, what are you doing? As the leader, what example are you setting um, for your other leaders uh, to follow? You know, one big thing I do is just the is the uh, thank you cards. You know, I did ten of them this morning just to if they were new hires or anniversary or you know did well last week or or whatever it is. And I think that's just so important. And I think it's it's a very easy thing, but it often gets overlooked. Um, and I always say to myself, you know. Yeah, writing out thank you cards is, you know, it takes a little bit of time, but at the end of the day, you should be able to write one in about 
a couple of minutes, but the impact that it can have, and I think sending it to their house. Uh, I know you're a big proponent of getting the family involved. Uh, when you get the wife or the you know the spouse involved, all of a sudden they're like, well, you're not leaving that job. They had a bad day. You're not leaving that job. They care about you there. And I think that's just so important. Yeah. I mean, I really think this, this software, I'm going to master it for a few months and then I'm going to pass it down and I'll be able to track the usage of how my managers are engaging with their people. So I'll get reports that I want them to at least keep up with me. So you start from my level and then you go out to the VP level and the C-suite and then you go all the way down to market manager, directors and, and, and lead technicians. And there'll be a way for them to submit for me, like for recognition, like this guy's been killing it. It would be great if he heard from you. So I think that's so important. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and I think it can it can get lost when it's just, you know, numbers, 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 numbers. Um, and you get paralyzed by the data when at the end of the day, it's it's people. Uh, we're, we're both in the business of selling skilled labor. They can go, you know, they can probably go get garage door parts or parts for their water heater at Lowe's or Home Depot. But what we sell is we know how to do it. Um, and we know how to, uh, you know, fix whatever it is that, uh, that they need fixing for sure. Well, what do you, let me ask you, what are you seeing out there? I, I've talked to a lot of people that just are not doing good. Like a lot, a lot of people like, it seems like they're kind of coming down from where they were. And it's not like a one-off. It's it's a lot of people. And I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not really worried who gets into office and whatnot, but I'm just curious from your perspective what you're seeing and hearing and how you're feeling out there. Yeah, I mean, I think we see the same thing, right? It's There's a lot of people that uh, don't really know the fundamentals or are not paying attention to them. Just like we talked about at the outset, you know, booking a call. Uh, I've talked to so many people that it's like, well, who's answering your phone calls? Well, I do. I'm like, well, that's not going to work. Like, do you answer all of them? You know, you're out there working and these are smaller companies, but, you know, we've got to have someone that, you know, answers the phone. But, you know, to answer your question, I think I think we're all seeing the same thing. It's it's a little bit tougher out there. Um, but it's not impossible. It just takes a little bit more effort to get the job done um, and making sure that people are doing things right and that you're maximizing every call. I, I think for, for so long during COVID, it was really easy not to maximize every call because, well, there's four more sitting on the board that I can you know take a swing at. But yeah, I mean, I feel like that's what I'm seeing. I mean, I, obviously, there's a lot of, you know, I call it kind of noise out there in the economy and just the outside world. And I think this election only amplifies that to where people are paying attention to all this stuff. And it's like, you don't need to pay attention to that stuff. The The good thing is, is, you know, we're in the home service industry and everybody's got to go home and stuff breaks um, and you got to get it fixed. So I think that's, that's for me, it's like, how do you, you know, I don't watch the news or anything like that because to me, it's just a distraction. Uh, if we keep doing what we're supposed to do um, and know that we can do, then at the end of the day, we're going to get, we're going to knock it out of the park and move it forward. But yeah, I think that there's, it'll be interesting. I think over the next 18 months, I think you're going to see some interesting stuff happen to the people that don't really know how to operate these places. I think so too. I think what's going to happen here is, uh, you know, as we're prepping to go into these 12 months, I'm just, dude, you're never going to see anybody work as hard as me. I mean, and I usually say I, I'm, a, I'm a better delegator than I am worker harder. <laughs> um, but I'm just setting all the pieces up. Like I got my eye on the prize. And what's super cool about knowing you're going in and it's like, you know what the plan is. A lot of people don't know. They just, they get a, an offer and then they're like, sure. No, that's a great offer. Like when you're setting it up and you know all the stakeholders and you understand the the, the exact goal of 112.5 million of EBITDA, uh, and that's where you're chasing, and you know exactly what needs to happen to get there. I mean, we've got 52 people coming in this. They're, they're here right now actually training next door. And I got to get classes over 50 for the rest of the year. I mean, these numbers that I need to hit are going to take a lot of acquisitions, three more greenfield markets, start to look at other things to do other than just fix and replace garages. I've got to open the door to new things to change the market cap. So 
as as hard as it seems, like I've got the exact details of what needs to happen, and my whole C suite's behind me on this. And if it doesn't hit the exact deadlines, oh well, we got to wait three more months. And I don't think that's going to happen because we've never lost steam as each month has been growing, especially year over year, but month over month has been growing as well. I want to talk a little bit about Greenfields. We just did one in February in Louisville, Kentucky, um, and then preparing to do another one here at the end of the year, which should be good. What, what do you, when you think about a Greenfield, what do you, what does that process look like for you guys? So first, uh, I can go through like a basic strategy. You want to take some of your most well-cultured person and have them relocate there for at least six months. They've got to go there. And the one thing you're doing the first, before they go out there for the first six months is like a soft launch. You're doing stuff for free or $10 tune-ups. I mean, you're just trying to get reviews, get your Yelp, get your Google, get all those algorithms moving. And what happens is user-generated content, getting reviews, building a second location, getting things super dialed where people know who you are. It's getting TV, radio. It's literally spending, you know, if your goal is to do $10 million your first year, you got to spend $3 million in that market. And you got to expect to not be in the black the first year. So either that or you're going to buy a company and borrow money and pay them, you know, 5 to 10x, whatever you're paying. So reviews are the first part and making sure every single algorithm you're, you're – you're, Angie's List, Yelp, Kudzu, you know, the, the, even the ones that don't even matter, you got to just, you got to become part of the BBB. Then you got to have someone on the ground building relationships, whether it's custom builders, whether it's realtors, try to get the, you know, five guys busy just through other things, whether your trucks are driving around and you got to blitz the marketing hardcore and you got to hire th- those first five hires are going to make or break that greenfield. You got to get badass people. And I think people just go in saying, we're just going to go slow, and they hire two guys. And that's a mistake. I think you got to pound the marketing, take market share as quick as possible. you got to be more of an omni approach and just be willing to spend. But you got to look at your booking rate and your conversion rate and your average ticket. And you cannot wait long. The one thing you could throttle is pay-per-click. So you could turn that off if you, got bad, if you don't have the performance you want. And rehire. You got to move through people. Unfortunately, like I, I've talked to Ken Goodrich a lot about this, you might have to flow through 30 to 40% of the people. I mean, we don't like training necessarily people in the industry, but what's nice about going for a greenfield for us, we're not going to buy a company that's 300,000 of EBITDA to go into a market, but we'll buy them if we're already there. So it opens up a whole new opportunity to start buying databases. And I, I look at buying a small company like that as buying their database. Literally, we're, that's, we're taking their marketing source, especially if they're spending very little in marketing. It's a great opportunity. No, I, I think about it the exact same way. I've, I've made the mistake of buying smaller companies. And at the end of the day, you're not really getting much but their database. Uh, so it's like, well, when you compare what you paid for the company, could you have just put that in marketing behind your own brand and created something maybe... You know, it's a little bit slower off the launch, but I think long term it, it pays dividends. And then to your point, then you go buy them once you're already established because trying to get people to switch all, over all of their, you know, more than likely they worked at a small company because they want to work at a small company. Um, there's plenty of opportunities to go work for bigger ones. Yeah. You know, not everybody makes the switch. I mean, some people like to run eight leads a day. Some people like to only fix the problem. Some people hate relationships. Some people are very just transactional and they're like, I just go fix the problem. And they're just mad at the world. Those people don't, they don't last for us. The biggest mistake I think you could save between branch and, and you look at service champions and, and you look at some of the new competition in the garage door space, I can tell you is uh, number one, it takes them a, a, at least three months to make a decision. They're super into cybersecurity. They, they build these large HR teams, which I'm against. I think HR should be a smallest function in a company because in blue collar, it makes a big difference. Like people are going to offend you. They got to go through sensitivity training. They don't fire the top people. You could ruin an organization. And the other part is they just, they bought good companies, but they didn't make them work together. They got a hodgepodge of Frankenstein. And so people are using different marketing agencies within one company under one roof. You know, people are, 
selling service agreements. Other guys aren't. People are using different finance companies. People are still on different insurances. So it's not properly integrated. And I can tell you that those companies, they're not doing themselves any favors. Yes, they're generating a lot of income, but they don't get any economies of scale. And that's a mistake. Yeah. No, I think you're... uh... 100% 100% right. And, and that's how they kind of went to market, right? It was, well, we'll just let you, you know, you just keep doing your thing. But there's so much leverage that you can get from being big and being able to leverage, you know, whether it's buying or, you know, marketing or anything like that. So, yeah, it's it's been an interesting uh, an interesting run. Um, and we'll see how some of those pan out and if they do or if they just patched it all. And someone, I was talking to somebody in the, the space earlier today and he was he was what did he call it he called it uh they called it a pile up basically you're just piling up a bunch of companies trying to wrap a bow on it and trying to move it to the next buyer and it'll be their problem and and buyers are becoming way more sophisticated i mean three four years ago that stuff worked now you're not going to get the arbitrage period and it, it takes an overhaul when you go into that it's still a good deal but people just think they can just take three companies hodgepodge them together. And now we're a much bigger EBITDA. And that's just not real anymore. And and unfortunately for a lot of these companies, it's like, you know, any one of my technicians could fly into any market with the same tools, the same truck, the same price book. My CSRs could answer in any single market without hesitation. Nothing's different. And you know how hard it is to build that to where everything's the exact same in every single market especially when you're buying businesses. And I'm not patting ourselves on the shoulder because there's a lot of work to be done, but I'd say we built with the end site in mind of selling. And we know that it needs to look and feel the same in every market. Even if it's not a one garage door service, the guy needs, that's how you get the economies of scale is when I could take a top guy and send him to any market and they just put on a different shirt, you know? And I think that there's a big advantage to doing that. And I don't think, I don't know what's going to happen. I think some of the bigger companies are going to fall. I don't think Wrench Group are service champions, but I think some of these, you hear about these really unsophisticated small PE companies that are over levered uh, with interest rates are up, which the Fed better be <laughs> lowering interest rates this month. Uh, I don't know how much you're paying attention, but it's pretty bad. Tell us a little bit. I know you got your event coming up here end of end of end of September. Tell us a little bit. Uh, I guess the listeners who I think you can still sign up and everything like that from what I've seen. So tell us a little bit more about uh, that event and what's going to go on there. I know I'll be there um, in beautiful San Diego. So I appreciate you picking a spot where the weather's nice. Yeah, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. So these events, man. I, I'll tell you. Like I learned a lot with Chris's event of just getting great people that have been who we're, where we want to go. And it's pretty universal. Any industry could come. Uh, I've learned the most by far from the HVAC industry because they've been working together forever, whether it's Ron Smith or Frank Bau or George Brazil. They've been doing this for 30, 30 to 50 years, whereas a lot of industries just started talking to each other. So there's some inspiration. There'll be Leland there, um, you know, Ken Goodrich. There'll be Paul Kelly, you know, those guys. Those are the godfathers. And then there's guys like Keith Mercurio that that are really inclined to just attitude and culture. There's Jocko, which is all about discipline and execution. Darius Livers is awesome. I really appreciate where he's coming from. He's one of Apex's strongest running companies, and he's just got a world of knowledge. You know, you'll be there. Gainer's going to be there. Great, great people. Ellen Rohr is going to be making financial simple that she's going to be talking. Tom Howard will be there. So great group of people. I want to talk a lot about what happens outside of work. What happens to your culture? What happens when you start working out? What happens when you start getting serious about your brain and showing up in a bigger way? But what I've learned over the years is I don't want to make it all mindset and I don't want to make it all tactical and strategic. It's got to be a mesh of both. And I hope they just look at their business quite a bit different. I hope they come out and it really it's called the freedom event, freedomevent.com. It really is about freedom. And a lot of people are trapped. They're they're working 24-7. They don't know their next move. And if they can get one takeaway, one relationship, one major breakthrough, they're going to be ultra successful. And that's what we're looking for. I I think I'll probably have a couple hundred people from last event that we did that have lost 50 pounds or more. 
And I'm telling you, they, they look at themselves differently and people look at them differently and they respect them more and they feel healthier and they wake up more excited. And that's fun. And it's cool to see some of the people in their 60s all the way down to their 20s making a difference that are getting serious like, I love myself and I'm going to take care of myself because not a lot of people do. And some people need a little nudge on that kind of stuff. You know, the cool thing about our industry, I think, is this the the openness and the willingness that people have to help. Um, and, you know, I would urge anybody that's, you know, struggling or, you know, doing really well, regardless of what it is. I, I think it's an event that, uh, as you said, it, it's got a, the, it's got a little bit of everything, which I think is good. Uh, we've all been to the events that are all about mindset or all about the tactical. And, you know, to me, combining them, they do play uh, a huge role. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know I had a ton of takeaways and the stuff you learn outside the room, right? Whether it's at dinner or just passing in the hall or whatever it may be, there's just everybody's there to help one another. And I think that's really, to me, the, the reason I go is, uh, you know, just to, to see people that you maybe haven't seen in a minute. And then the ideas and takeaways that you have, it could be something super small, but that super small thing could be a really big thing to somebody else uh, that hadn't thought of that or, or whatever it may be. So no, I appreciate you, uh, you putting it on and uh, I think it'll be, uh, it'll be a really good event again, which would be awesome here at the end of September. September 25th through the 27th. I will not disappoint. The people coming will not disappoint I mean, the legends are all going to be there. So I think it'll be uh, it'll be something special. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, again, Tommy, I appreciate it. I know you're busy um, and we'll we'll jump on another one here uh, momentarily. But uh, I really appreciate you sharing uh, some of the stuff that you're working on, some of the stuff you're thinking about. I think all of that, um, especially as it relates to kind of employee engagement um, and, and how we keep people on our teams motivated day in and day out, I think is, is extremely critical. So again, thank you for listening. Um, if you uh, if you enjoyed the episode, uh, be sure to subscribe, uh, leave us a review. Uh, remember, growth is a journey. It's all about taking small steps forward each and every day. Keep pushing yourself, embracing new challenges, and never stop striving for progress. Until next time, keep growing, keep learning, and remember, you can't stop the growth. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to get connected, you can find me at chadmpeterman.com. To see what our team's up to, you can visit petermanbros.com. As always, keep growing out there.